welcome to post break um today my name is chris peterson i'm a board secretary at the pnya and chair of the education and events committee and right now i'm producing some vfx on a scripted feature as my day job <laughs> um today's topic is a conversation with senior post about the bear also a lot of volunteers stepped up tonight to to make this big event happen whether it's the zoom part or the in-person part i think you can see all, all the people gathered today over at senior post so a big thank you to all those those volunteers it's just fantastic especially in the dog days of summer here so we'll we'll be yes clap love it um and we will we will put everyone's names on social when we post the edited version of this episode and now to introduce our moderator, she's a filmmaker. She started working on award-winning ad campaigns and documentaries. And now as an AE, her credits include The Idea of You on Amazon MGM, The Gilded Age on HBO, and The Good Fight on Paramount+. Plus. She is, of course, a PNYA member and uh, a member of, of the Education and Events Committee. Please welcome Inga Morin Tapias. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited about this event. So I'm um, first going to introduce our amazing speakers today. We're so excited to have you guys here. So I'm going to start with um, David Wood, Woods. He has served as a producer in over 200 episodes of television, including the Emmy-winning series, The Bear, of course, and the Emmy-nominated series, The Americans. Um, Joanna Nogol, ECE, is a television and film editor best known for her work on The Bear, of course, for which she won a primetime Emmy, two ACE Eddie Awards, and two British Film Editors Cut About Awards. And, and then we have Evan Wolf um, Baxbaum. He is the chief operating officer of Senior Post, the post production company behind the bear. So um, Evan is Evan is going to tell us a little bit about Senior Post. Oh, uh, welcome everyone! Uh, great, great to have you here. For everyone here who's in person, welcome to Brooklyn. Uh, feel free to get relaxed, as you can tell. We try to set up a place that has a very homey feel. If you want to get a drink, get a drink. You're not going to offend anyone. Uh, welcome. It's great to have you here. And for everyone who's uh, tuning in and isn't here, uh, we would love to have you and show you the space whenever you want to swing by. Uh, this is Senior Post. Um, it's where we we cut the bear, among, among other things. Uh, we are an editorially driven post house. Uh, for us, story and uh, editorial are are of prime importance. Um, and you'll see that if you walk around the facility with us in the way that we've designed it, uh, we try to put people in a position uh, to make their best work and to make really compelling story-driven work. Uh, and that's that's who we are. Uh, we'd love to work with any and all of you if, if that sounds like something you wanna be a part of. <laughs> yes. Great. Yeah, we want to yeah. make sure that we know we're here. We were going to do the applause things, but we couldn't have done yeah, that. Yeah, we can do this. Too. All right, awesome. So we're just going to start with the first question. Remember, this is an informal Q&A. We have a mic there. So when you have a question, you can go up to it and speak to it. And please tell us your name. We want to know who you are. <laughs> and so my first question to you guys is, you know, tell me something that was special that you learned from working on this series that you had no idea before you start working in it. Um, you can start. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, you're enjoying it. Uh, I love working on the show. I love the show itself. I love getting to watch other episodes that I'm cut and just be a fan of the show. Um, I think the main thing we talk about a lot in the show is that we hear a lot about how fast the editing is and how stressful it is, but we also really try to find moments where there's it's really quiet and really slow. So I think um, as I was cutting the pilot, it was so fun, but like 
Chris Storr, who created the show, like gave me the note, like you should make it unwatchable. Like make it so hard for people to watch that their palms are sweating because they need to like turn it off and catch their breath. And like, I had never gotten that note before. So it was really fun to be like, okay, what are all the different things that I can do with this? I can overlap dialogue. I can have two different songs playing at once. We can like cut really quickly to still images. Like what are the things we can do? Um, but then when the other main editor on the show, Adam Epstein came on, he was like, well, if we're always going at like hundred miles per hour the whole time, it's gonna start losing its effect. So I think this show just really made me um, cognizant of like changing the like acceleration and changing the pace and what that feels like to like have a really slow scene next to a really fast scene. And like, what does that mean as a viewer? Like what is, what is the emotional response to that? So I think it, this has taught me so much about like pacing and like giving the audience like just enough that they can hang on to, but like leave them wanting more. Um, and trusting that the audience will pick up on things along the way, not always having to like spell things out 100%. Fantastic. What do you think, David? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember, it's interesting going back to like the first moment you were, you were talking about like when you started season one. So I came on season two and I don't know if, I guess I should stand a little closer to the mic to be, sh to be sure. Um, I remember Josh telling me like, oh man, you know, I had seen season one and it was amazing. And uh, like, what do you need? be the come off season like it was just like it was it was killer the pace was killer making the show was killer and um and so you know you make a post schedule and 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 you wonder you know i think anyone there's probably only like three people in this audience who like maybe has made a post schedule but you make a post <laughs> schedule and it's kind of like a little bit of like a hope like if everything goes right, if everything goes right like this is this is this is never changes never changes hope always stays the same but like for this show, it's always been, a, it always airs at the same time and then we shoot at the same time. So like there is like, it is what it is and it's fast. And I thought, well, I'm going to put a schedule together that delivers, you know, in, in the case of season three, um, I'm going to put a schedule together that has 10 episodes delivering in over, over two and a half weeks. Like, you know, and, and that means, you know, <laughs> that means a lot of great version. Yeah and a seamless version and we can gotcha. do that sure you know and you know you put a schedule like that together I, I guess what I I guess what I can say I learned is if if you have the right team you can accomplish almost anything and I feel like this team is the right team and 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 accomplished that it was certainly challenging but but I guess it showed me what was possible like you know you can you can make something of quality within a short amount of time if you plan it right and you have the right the right team and the right sort of you know just environment amazing what about you Heather? yeah i mean i was gonna say a similar thing i think joanna you know when you said that the cutting was so fast-paced i think what i learned on this show is like how fast you can make a show <laughs> <laughs> literally the fastest possible um, and that took a lot uh, from a lot of people, many of whom are here, some of whom are, are not. But um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty incredible. Awesome. Well, so now let's go to the audience. Who's going to be our first victim? Introduce <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Hello, I'm Yael. Uh, and I wanted to ask if there have been any notable changes in your post workflow between the first or in your case, the second season and now. I think maybe some small tweaks. I think rooms. I mean, I mean, can you moved, think about it? We moved some like, people around, but yeah. <laughs> we definitely between season two and three, we did almost everything remotely yeah. for season two. Yeah. And we did have more in-person editing for a very short and intense time in season three. Um, I do think I think the biggest thing was we had a lot of the same, I, I think we had ex pretty much exactly the same team. I think we all learned so much working together season two. There was a little bit of team change between one and two. And then two and three was basically, the, we're basically the same team. And it's just, and I've been fortunate enough to be in a situation on a few series where you can keep the same, keep continuity of a team. And it is amazing how much better you get working together as a team. Come to think of it, I don't think we could have done season three without having gelled as a team for season two. When I was talking about, like, we literally did finish shooting, we finished getting material, like, on a Sunday, and then it was, we delivered all of the episodes within two and a half weeks of that, receiving that last footage. So you don't do that if it's the first time working together, probably. And I guess that probably 
there probably was a little insanity in that idea. There was a necessity in that idea, but there was also a confidence I felt like I had in the team having seen what we had accomplished before for season two. And we also, I think in season two, we did some of this. In season three, we did even more like pre-mixes too. Oh. Like we were doing a lot of mixing while we were cutting. And like, if we were feeling like the episode was in a pretty good place, um, the team at Sound Lounge was so incredible, led by Major. Um, and so we were like getting a lot of like tent mixes and it made watching things a lot better for, I think, the producers. But it also required a lot of tracking on our part to be like, okay, we're going to leave the, the stems as like a guide track, but also we're making changes, making sure that carries over. So I think it was like essential, but it also created some, it made some things easier, some things harder, I'd say. I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I feel like for years, I will talk to anybody who would listen and maybe I'll have like a whole post alliance panel at some point <laughs> about this, but I really wish there were more tools to help us, you know, edit picture, edit sound, do visual effects, color, you know, sort of all in, in, in a timeline as much as we can because they do feed off of one another and it is kind of it is tough on so many people who work in post to constantly be turning things over here here and then needs to go into three different types of software and then yeah. and then be reconformed and and there was so much reconforming in season three you don't deliver an episode you don't just start the work on the monday after the sunday you finish the footage you, you get the last footage and then deliver those episodes you do a massive amount of reconforming and that falls on an amazing, talented, and dedicated team, both on the picture side, the picture online side, and the sound side, which you mentioned. Like it, it's it's all it's an incredible amount of work, and um, and and certainly, you know, I'm I'm in awe of and uh, feel fortunate to work with all those folks. Great, nice and okay great so let's move on wait we're gonna move on to the zoom now <laughs> so i know you're excited wait one second we're gonna get to you so this question oh okay never mind hold on one second okay so this is from robert figured hi um what were the episodes that evolved the most in the edit on the bear? in the post process and uh, how did they handle those editorial challenges? I know what I said. I know okay. what I said. <laughs> changed the most to me. Um, we had an episode in season two that was following Sydney's like food tour journey. And it was episode, it's episode 203. Um, and I think that's the one that ended up like morphing the most mm -hmm. from the script to the final version. And we had another editor help us out with the first pass of it, Naya Amani, she's so talented. Um, but they shot it way more open-ended, like it was way more like doc mm -hmm. style. So like her first pass was like super long and it felt like, uh, Sometimes it just felt like we were following Io around the city, to be honest. Like it was like, oh, this is just like Io getting to try all these amazing foods. Great for her. And so we really had to like figure out how to like trim it down and make it feel like we're going on a journey with Sydney. We're building her character. And we ended up taking a lot of these really long scenes and kind of like remorphing them into different montages. So finding the structure of that was something that Chris and Josh and Joanna and I really talked a lot about. Like, okay. What are the moments that we really want to lean into? It was also kind of the beginning of starting to have this like simmering tension with Carmi and Sydney. So like that was like kind of the A story was like Sydney's going out and she's trying to like, you know, be creatively inspired. And then she comes back and Carmi has made all these decisions without her. And that's obviously become a recurring theme in their relationship. But we didn't want to lose track of that. But we also want to use it as an opportunity to like get to know Sydney a little better. Um and it was also really our first episode where we start to like zero in on the characters. So I think that was also like an interesting thing to kind of like figure out is like, what does like a tour of Chicago look like through Sydney's perspective? And like, we really tried to like cut that differently. And like, as we're getting in her head and seeing like her on the river tour boat and seeing like, you know, the shape of the windows and then cutting to like paint swatches that are the same um, shape and then seeing like, you know, this plate in her head of what it could be like, we wanted to, I wanted to feel like it's like the different like synapses firing in her brain of like, oh, these are all the different things that are like coming together in her mind. And she thinks so differently than Carmi. It was like fun to be like, oh, let's choose music that feels a little bit more specific to maybe what Sydney would listen to. Let's like lean into maybe like having cutting between things in a different way in a different pace than we would with Carmi. So anyway, I think that episode was like, in hindsight, so crucial because we were like introducing all these new ideas of like zeroing in on characters and that. Um, but like the way that it started, it was just like, oh my God, this is gonna be like a feature length documentary. And we we're like, no, actually, I think it's like a really solid like 26 minutes and we gotta like condense, condense. So there was a lot of really like brutal cuts that were made, but 
I I love how it turned out. So it's it was it was worth the struggle for sure. That makes sense. Can you think of another? I I, I know. I'm trying to think of what's number two. Because, <laughs> That's because that one. that was yeah. very clearly to be number one also. And and I guess just to yes and that for one quick second, then I'll try and buy time to think of what number two can be. Um, is yeah, it, it it was so much, and I've seen you do this on across more than one episode. One of the things I love about the show, and I love about any shows that sort of try to tackle this, is like filming real people who yeah. who do something. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, it was people who work in it was people who work at these different restaurants, and yeah. and like there were they would sit there and describe what they're doing as they're chopping the meat, yep. the, the butcher or or the the meeting pre pre shift meeting. We'd have the whole, whole pre shift meeting. Yeah. It was a lot of footage, and and seeing what you did with that footage and turn it into exactly what you described it it did feel like to me like you turned a whole bunch of like documentary footage and some amazing just following um sydney around yeah. to chicago and seeing parts of chicago that we maybe don't always see um um yeah it was beautiful uh and I, yeah it definitely felt like you were thinking right along with her which is like the best thing i feel like we can do with shows is when you can think with your along with your protagonist without even hearing your mm -hmm. thoughts um gosh it's hard to think of a number two um <laughs> I, I, I i wasn't around season one but i do think the pilot the oh, pilot yeah. had some transformation from what i was told um sort of after the fact um i try to think if there's anything else yeah i mean yeah the pilot definitely did change a bit partly out of like necessity and partly because we had a little bit of like time away from it. And we're able to come back to it. There was like a song we couldn't clear mm -hmm. that we like loved in the first pilot, which I know Nick remembers. But, <laughs> um, and we were like so attached to it. We're like, we can't imagine it any other way. And then we ended up having to switch it. And it was like the best thing that could have happened because the song that's in there right now but is by the Budos band. And I love it so much. It's like the first montage that kind of like gets us in Carmi's head. And that montage evolved a lot over time. Like it was never scripted to be that way. It was supposed to be different scenes. And then Chris, to his credit, was like, I feel like it's just starting so slow i think this show needs to just like start like a shot of adrenaline and be like it's gonna get kind of crazy are you in are you out like right mm. from the beginning and so what started as like different scenes of like carmy doesn't get enough of the beef then he goes and he sells the jeans then he sets a ball breaker where we chris was like okay we have like 12 minutes of this can we do it in three minutes and then we ended oh. up just like condensing mm -hmm. condensing adding in all these different things we added in still photos of like you know family congregate around food mm -hmm. um we added in like uh different like uh stock footage i think of like chicago and stuff like that so it was just like a way to be like okay we're going to introduce you to our world and not hold your hand too much and just be like okay let's let's just like be off to the races and uh set the tone for like kind of where we were going but that definitely took a lot of time to figure out and was different from how it was written yeah that's very interesting to know because i'm always curious to see like from the page to the screen mm -hmm. so it's like you have a lot of room after to like read you know, I so said that's really fun. Yeah, but, I can tell you which one changed yeah. the least. Yeah. The wanner. The wanner. Ah, that's <laughs> pretty much easiest as, picture lock ever. Pretty much as written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of temps out. Okay. Awesome. All right. So now we'll take our next question. Hello, I'm Jenna. Um, my question is about genre. So when you approach editing the show, do you kind of view it through the lens of a drama or a comedy, or does genre just you just throw it out the door, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we're a comedy at the end of the day, but we definitely have dramatic moments. So I think finding, yeah, I think it's like about finding the balance. Like I think the best concrete example I have of that is the Christmas episode because um, that is one of our heaviest episodes, but I think it's also really funny at times too. And one of the things that wasn't originally scripted, but they ended up shooting was all the little kind of like asides with the Fat Brothers. So like oh, yeah. them like pitching Cicero, mm -hmm. their like horribly stupid baseball card mm -hmm. um, idea, them smoking weed with Sarah Paulson, like in, in the bathroom. Um, that was all stuff that wasn't originally scripted. And I think when Chris was shooting it, he was like, people are literally going to have a heart attack if we don't have like some moments of levity. So I think that was like, so smart of him to be like, oh, when you're at these family gatherings, like things can be so tense. And then you'll have this one like goofy cousin who's like, you know, it's telling you the story. So I think that was a way that we were able to kind of find that balance between like, we want it to be really tension filled. We want it to feel like this like pot of water that's like boiling and getting closer and closer to like, you know, falling over, but also having those moments that are like a little bit of a momentary relief without like totally letting you off the hook. So um, I think, yeah, it, it's so fun to be able to like, 
make it feel natural to have those really dramatic moments, but then also have a laugh that doesn't feel like inappropriate or like out of left field. It's like finding those right moments to like sit in the uncomfortability, but also like break it and have a little bit of that relief too. Yeah, Very cool. I, to add to what you're saying, I think one of the really interesting things about this show too is just the way that it pushes the boundaries of comedy. Yeah. You know, especially since at, you know when Emmys come around and whatnot, I hear so much people are like, "Is it really a comedy?" Like, you know, obviously it's it's nominated in that category, and I I think there, we've had a lot of interesting discussions around the shifting sort of definition of comedy. You know, I think there's like escapist comedy that's always quite similar. It's very different from your normal life, but in terms of the way comedy has changed over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, I think there's sort of a dark-ish zeitgeist, yeah. an undercurrent of sort of like nervousness, I think, in, in America and around. And I think this show really encapsulates that, you know, it takes comedy into a place that I think a lot of people are feeling. And that's one of the reasons it has hit the zeitgeist so hard. Um, obviously, there are a lot of comedies that are less stressful. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting, it, it shows the progression of comedy, I think, very interestingly. I see. Okay, so now we take another question from Soon. Oh, before we take that yes. question, I want to jump in on this one. Because, because, yeah, comedy and because you know, I think I've read a thousand people's answer on this. <laughs> Yeah. On on is is the bear a comedy? Is yeah. the bear a drama? Is it? Like yeah. is and, it? and and first of all, if I was gonna come up with an award, like I don't know, we'll call it the the Jimmies. And <laughs> and somebody's gonna say, David, Jimmy. how should we break it up? Like it seems obvious to me. You do not break it up by some artificially constructed genre called drama mm -hmm. and by comedy. You do not do that. You you make it hard and you make it fast and you make it like what is the average length of an episode and you give it a cutoff and that's that's what you do that's what I think you should do now that's not <laughs> what they did that's not what they did so then you have to be asked questions like or you have to answer questions like is it a drama or is it a comedy well I would ask the person who's asking me what is your life is your life a comedy or is your life a drama both. I would I would they would probably say both okay great <laughs> so then anything could be anything. Right? Okay. And then I look, <laughs> and the only other answer I really love that I want to repeat, uh, like I, I love somebody asked Steve Martin what the difference is between a comedy and a drama. And I'm sorry for those I've already like said this to you. <laughs> I love this answer. It's like in a comedy, people walk fast. <laughs> and in a drama, people walk slow. And I, I, I think that's right. I think we live with both all the time. You walk slow and you walk fast. And, you know, I mean, Who wants so, these limiting genres? That's anyway. true. Life is not like that. The real life. And I think that, you know, for me, like dark comedy, you know, like those moments that are just like, you can't even believe, you know, like somebody getting like a, the worst news ever, but it's like, it just, it's funny how the thing is so bad, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, dark comedy is definitely, or, you know, in that sense, definitely where we're going with it. Thank you for that. So now we'll take the question from the Zoom. Let me see. So this is from Grace Klein. Can you talk about how you keep post post happy and running smoothly on such a hectic schedule? <laughs> lots of beverages. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking lots of things, things to eat and food drink. And drink yeah, involved. food and drink, couches. Did anyone ever get a little a little something? Yeah. <laughs> Keeping everyone. <laughs> um. Wait. People are happy. <laughs> um, you know, I think not everybody's built for this. I think that's probably obvious to, to everyone who came out at 7 p.m. Uh, to Brooklyn, which, oh, I guess I'll take a quick moment. It is amazing to see this community. I love the New York Post community, and it's amazing to see everybody in one room. I know these events have been happening for uh, a little bit of time, but this is my first one, and it's actually, like, a little emotional to, like, think that, here we are in a room together. We haven't been in a room together in a while. And um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. But um, uh, now I totally forgot what the question was. Oh, how to keep happy. I think if you're built for this, I think that uh, then that's sort of number one. And then I think number two is all of us, I think, got into this probably if you got into it for the right reasons, you got into it because you're trying to do something that's creatively ambitious. I certainly seek it out on shows I work on, and I think the show is creatively ambitious. And so, if you're working, if you're if you're putting the time in on that, I think, 
I think you hopefully find something in the work you love and that's why you come in and you do it and you do it for long hours sometimes. Um, I think that has to be it. Yeah. But the food and drink help. The food and drink help, yeah. Yeah, I think I would say like, I'm someone who thrives off positive reinforcement and like on this show, it definitely comes from the top down. Like Chris Store is such like enthusiastic yeah. collaborator and like he will literally like, you know, see an episode and be like, fuck yes, this is awesome. And I'm like, yes, I feed off that energy, you know? So I think when people think about giving notes, like I try to pass that on too, of like, don't just call out the stuff that's not working. Like make sure you call out the stuff that is working. Cause like a lot of time too, it's like, oh my gosh, like you can sit there and beat yourself up over how you totally missed the point of the scene. But like, if no one tells you the other, like, Four scenes around it are working then you're just like only focusing on the negative so all that to say like you should be honest you should give criticism but also like make sure to call out the good stuff too because I think that's what keeps me going is like okay yes these things aren't working but like also let's take a moment and appreciate like this scene is so funny we nailed it okay cool now this is a mess let's move on to that but like that it keeps things going yeah, I think part of keeping people happy like by definition is that everyone has to kind of start happy you know and I think one of the one of the big things about this show and one of the reasons it's able to be done so fast, honestly, is just the lack of ego on this show from people who are involved. I think everyone on this show is passionate about the show and wants to be making a great show. And I think that has really fueled how we've been able to make it, honestly. Um, so I think that's a that's a huge thing. Everyone, the pe people who work on the show, um, you guys, I've been sitting up here, obviously, but everyone else is here. It's just people who really are passionate about what they do. And that's a huge part of it. It's amazing. Oh, it's good not to have an ego. <laughs> I think it's a lesson to anybody coming in new in the industry. I will say that will help you a long way. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, so now let's take a question from the audience. Let us know your name. Hi, I'm Joe. Um, I had a quick question. So you guys mentioned the speed at which this show was cut. Um, I know TV's pretty fast usually my first kind of question would be did you have the opportunity where it was like episode one you had a lot more time with and it slowly got shorter and shorter and shorter and if so it sounds like yes but if so how do you keep quality control as you go through episode one which has all that time and then you kind of get shorter and shorter for season three it was the opposite season one <laughs> or sorry episode one was like um because if you if you've seen uh, episode one, it's like this huge expanse of time. We're going back in the past for Carmi. So specifically on this season, one was interesting because it was something I got to keep revisiting as like things came in. And the very last thing that came in was them shooting in Copenhagen and Noma. So that's the stuff David was talking about. Like they were shooting it about a month, a month ago, a month and a half ago, <laughs> like looking back on it. Um, so anyway, that was an interesting one because they do a lot of block shooting. So we'll be like, oh, today we got a little piece of 403 or 303. We got a little piece of 307. We got a little piece of 309. And then they kind of come in and then the episodes are all kind of like sand castles that are building at different speeds. So um, I always like to try to stay up to date with the dailies. So if it's my episodes, I'm just like, okay, I want to like get the scenes and keep them coming together. And then once I have at least 75% of it, I'm like, okay, let's start building it into the episode. And, um, you know, you want all the little pieces to be as good as they can be, but until you see the whole episode, you can't really tell what's working. And then until you see the whole season, you really can't tell what's working. So I think the quality control is something that like, we kind of just have to all keep each other honest about. And also, Chris and Josh do such a great job of like looking at that bird's eye view and saying like, you know, actually we should put more emphasis on this scene because it's going to come back later if we haven't like finished the finale yet or something like that. Um, but at least in this case, episode one kind of had the most time and the least time. Uh, episode two is what we finished first. That's the one that was like, they shot it all in like two days. We were able to just kind of like, that was one of the first things I shot. Um, and it was really fun because it was so like condensed. So we got to go from episode one with like literally 116 scenes to episode two, which is like one scene. So that was like a fun kind of juxtaposition also. Yeah, great. Amazing. Do you have any yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I guess the inverse of, of, of the first episode is we had a couple episodes that were like, almost like basically shot a day. Um, so, so yeah, one, one had a like months long shoot and one had one day shoot. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So no 10 days, huh? So it can be one or it's crazy. Yeah. Or a month. And I guess, yeah. and, um, I'll add to that and also 
sort of jump in on some answers I loved. I love the sandcastle analogy. It was totally, it came to that, me, that right? visual really <laughs> works for me. And that is what it felt like. Yeah. That is what it felt like. Um, and and um, yeah, I was, I was thinking back. I, I, I think what's hanging over a lot of this is you mentioned Chris Dorr and Josh mm -hmm. Senior. And, and one of the things that I think makes making this show possible is Chris Dorr as a writer director and, and Joanna Kalo's writing too. Um, the is is the the decisiveness and the and and the reason why it was hard for us to come up with episodes I think that changed a lot is that so many didn't. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. yeah. Inga, what you were saying, like it, what was on the page. Like there are times sometimes where like I feel like in the edit we try things, and then sometimes I'll go back and look at the script. And I'm like. Oh man, it's actually better the way it was in the script. Like, yeah. let's put it like like that might be a better way to do it. It it is pretty remarkable, and and I do think you know it in that way this show feels really special because there's so many ways of making a TV show, and oftentimes the writing and the directing of it are so separate, and yeah. that's what actually adds a lot of time. So so one of the so the main overarching sort of I think thing about the show is that decisions get made faster because it's way more centralized. And and they're so plugged into it. And and yes, I think the positive reinforcement, like yeah, I've never been so happy to see or hear like that's sick. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. that, 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 like I never thought that sentence would like yes. um yeah. you know get things going the way it does. Definitely. Anyway. That's really fun. <laughs> okay, cool. So now let's try another Zoom question. Let's see. So this is from uh, here we go. From camera Hendrix. I'm a newcomer to the industry. Given the current state of the industry, how did you manage to get where you are or you know, uh, where you needed to be like this project, despite the harsh times? How do you manage to navigate it? And what would you say to people new and old should, new and old should do at this time? Ooh. Man, that's, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a big one. My, I mean, I, I feel really lucky to be here um, because basically 12 years ago, I had just graduated from NYU. I knew I wanted to edit, but I wasn't really sure what to do. And a friend of mine introduced me to Josh Sr. And he had just opened Senior Post. And at that time, it was Senior Post was like us bringing our laptops to a rented desk and like cutting videos next to each other. And Josh and I just got along really well. We had really similar styles. So we kept working together. We kept working together. And then as we kept, you know, Josh kept getting bigger opportunities, we already had this kind of trust built up. So even when I didn't have the credits to like back up being, you know, eligible to like cut a comedy special he was like no I've been working here for years she can do it like same thing when like I got my first scripted tv opportunity with Rami Youssef Josh was like she can do it you should believe in her so I think the best advice I can give you is like find your people and like build that trust and like I used to get so annoyed when people were like working in this industry is all about who you know and like I really do believe that but not in like a sleazy way it's really like yeah. you should find the people who you work well with um go to events like this go to other like screenings talk about movies figure out who has the same taste because like those are the people you know most of the time you're not going to be sitting or submitting a resume for a job. It's going to be very much word of mouth of like, oh, I met this person. They seem like they're into the same sort of thing. Like I worked with them on one opportunity. You should give them a shot. I heard they're looking for this. Like there's so much of that that goes on that like, I think networking is a part of it. And luckily people in post tend to be very nice. So I think it's easy to just talk to them about what they're working on. And like, it might not happen immediately, but then in like a couple months, you're like, oh wait, we need an extra assistant editor on this. I met someone at this event. They seemed really enthusiastic and like, you know, it might come around. So um, yeah, I think just like meeting people and like meeting with people who like you communicate well with, you can build that trust because like, that's the most gratifying thing is being able to like get promoted and elevate your craft with the same people you've been working with for years. Like, I, I think there's like nothing better. It's, it's such a nice feeling. But I'm curious about your journey, David Woods. My journey. Yeah. Oh, I was actually thinking I should not tell that story at all. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> and, and, no, I mean, uh, I'll, I mean, I'll try to do it quickly. But, but I, I just, I feel like I don't know how helpful it is anymore because I do feel like um, who was the person who asked? Uh, the person that asked this question was Cameron. Cameron, I, I feel like what Cameron's bringing up is something I think about a lot. I talk about probably at least once a day with someone. Um, and I don't, I wish I had better answers. I think what Joanne just said 
is 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 awesome. I'm trying to think of something additive for it that's actually actionable and helpful. I feel like maybe recounting my biography is not helpful. <laughs> I because I I the reason I don't think it's helpful and I'm I'm happy to do it. But but I reason I don't think it's helpful is just the, the conditions are so different now. Yeah. And yeah. and um I do think there's probably something analogous, but I'll say this, I think what you said makes sense. And I think another thing that's kind of worked for me too, but it's it's gotta be really hard. I mean, but I think it's I think I think it's worth doing is what do you what is the content you like? And um whether that be something that's a movie or a TV show or a YouTube creator, whatever, whatever it is, I would I would say find a way to reach out to that person because that's easier than it's ever been. That's harder than it was when I was coming up. What was easier when I was coming up was there were jobs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like that would like you could like you could as long as you were willing to work really long hours and drive stuff all over the place. I, I started in LA, like you can get a job. Like it like I probably got my first job because I played college baseball, not because I could read or write. Like they just wanted somebody to drive stuff around. And I used that to like talk to every person I would drive stuff around to figure out what they did and start figuring out how you make films. Like, you know, so I guess I point that out by saying like, tr try to reach out. It's a numbers game for sure. Not everybody's going to respond, but it's, but at least, you know, you can kind of reach out to people. People exist on, various social media platforms and and try to find a way to engage them in a way that they would not have been engaged with before like <laughs> try to set yourself apart in the way in a good way the, the way they, the way and, and you know probably keep it on the work people love to talk about the work clearly we love to talk about the work um everybody loves talking about the work so i would say find a way to engage the people you really want to work with you really like their stuff and find a unique way to make it seem like you have something to offer. You've thought about their stuff. You're going to ask them some question or make some observation nobody else has made before. And they're going to be like, damn, who is that? And, and, or maybe you don't, but if you do that enough times and, and, and follow up without being a stalker, like, I think, I think it can come to good things. It, it doesn't always, but um, I'll just give a quick example. My favorite TV show that I do not work on is Rami, which was made in this space. And I saw Josh Sr. on a Zoom call one time for post people. And I messaged Josh. I didn't know Josh, but I remember his name from the credits. Cause I, oh, that's watch credits. There, there you go. I've given you something, watch credits. And you know, people put a lot of work into building those credits. They do. Checking those credits. Making sure they're spelled right, making sure their contractual obligations are met. <laughs> watch them, okay? If you even progress nothing else on anyone else tonight, it is yeah. to watch credits. All right. Anyway, I messaged Josh Senior on the Zoom call, and I'm like, I love Rami. You know, I would love to talk to you about how that show is made because there was something about the way Rami is made, and I think it has sheer DNA with the bear. Um, to me, it's like an independent film on television. And I got into this because I want to make independent films. And I came to New York thinking like, that's a way you can actually make a living. It is not. <laughs> but I got, I guess I got lucky in a way that independent film came to TV. And, 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 and I guess maybe I should have answered the first question of the bear showed me that independent filmmaking is as a sort of a methodology can be done in television. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not that there aren't any other examples there are, but maybe it's the highest profile, most successful example. I don't know. Um, I think somebody else can judge that. But um, but anyway, that little Zoom message turned into, um, so actually, I guess everybody that's on Zoom should be looking around at who's on the list and cross-checking it with what they like to make. But anyway. Um, watch the Zoom credits. <laughs> um, <laughs> memorize names. Um, Faces. But um, that started, uh, uh, email and phone call and Zoom relationship with Josh Senior, and we talked about shows and projects and editors we liked working with and how we made shows. I was lucky that I was already in a position where I was a producer at that point, so he probably took me more seriously than he probably like Googled me or IMDb'd me and and saw that I had actually done some stuff. So maybe that made a difference, but um, but who you never know. And so when the show called when he called me about the show called The Bear. 
you know, I I thought, okay, I'll watch it. Everybody says it's really great. I guess I'll watch <laughs> it and see if it's any good. Um, you know, it, it put me in a better position to, to be working on it. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say two things. I'll also spare you any sort of life story, but I think that, um, you know, we we bring on a lot of people, both on the bear and otherwise. We we work with a lot of editors. We hire a lot of people. Um, and I think something that's been really a trend for me is it's very rare that you're going to get hired with a new team that you have never worked with before to do the best thing that they're doing. It just never really happens that way because you don't really know each other. You don't know if it's going to work. You could both be the best at your job in the world, but you've never really met. So I think a lot of the people that we start working with, the first thing they do is something that kind of sucks, honestly, you know, something that's like not the best thing. And then when that goes really well, they end up working on something great next because we know we have a relationship. So I think what I would take from that is don't be shy to do at least one project that isn't like your favorite thing in the world if you think that the relationship is worth building. Um, because in my experience, that really is how they are, they're built. The second thing I would say is just that I feel like in this industry, it's so common. You find so many people, I have done this, I'm sure many people, where you're you're thinking like, what I'm doing right now, I don't like, but if I keep doing it, I'm going to do something great next year or the year after that. Like, I, And I think it's a it's a really difficult pattern. Like I said, it's one that I struggle with. I think if you can find a way to be to, to, to do the thing that you love in real time and to love what you're doing, then you will, you are guaranteed to be happy. If you're always thinking that if what you are doing is successful, you will do something that you like, the chances that you will get to that land are, are really unclear. So my, my recommendation would be there is find what you love to do um, and make sure that you're doing that today, not tomorrow. I love that. And, you know, I'll just add to that. I think, you know, I came from the camera world and, you know, it's like boot camp and they t always tell you, you know, arrive when you arrive early, you're really late, you know, so be early anywhere, follow up and follow up, you know, and be persistent. You know, I, you know, I, I know people that I have talked to for years and then eventually I work for them. So it's, it's a long game. So nothing is going to happen today or like next week. So it's about relationship building and being persistent and, you know, talking to people. Talk If you are a little bit shy, I think you're going to need to talk to people. So work on that. Uh, I think that's be helpful and follow up. And when you say you're going to do something, do it <laughs> and arrive on time. All right, cool. So <laughs> I, I, I like Evan's advice about, about uh, you know, taking the job, even if it's not on something that's, that you think is that great. I, <laughs> that job I was talking about, which I figured out, screwed out a, up a detail about. So my first, the first, the job I was signed up was Walker, Texas Ranger. I was a, I was, I was a production assistant that was working for both the writers and posts in an office in LA. But I real they really only hired me because they had a softball team. I left that part out. They had a softball team that was really not good. Yeah. And I and I played college baseball. Did you make it better? Did you make the team better? I did make the team better. <laughs> but but uh but I know that was another reason yeah. that I got hired. Awesome. Okay, so now we take another question from the audience. It's not as shy. Please. Hi, I'm Jason. Uh, you spoke about the sandcastle aspect of the editing. I was curious uh, if that's factored into the scheduling process in advance and how that kind of works, like uh, logistically. The scheduling process. Can I start with this one? Uh, you no, know, you should me. definitely. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone else is that. Just there are so many things that I appreciate about Joanna. Um, if she was. Uh, She's an extraordinary editor, an extraordinary person. But if if she was just like an average person and an average editor, it would still be extraordinary that you make these documents for each episode, <laughs> these Google documents. Yeah. They track every scene by like basically like what you would see on a strip board. And I'm I'm saying this tonight. I'm hoping <laughs> If five people do this, it's going to change the world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sponsored by Google Docs. Again, oh, sponsored by Google Docs. They need sponsorship. These Google Docs, which you know, it's like like strips of one-liners, and then it's like 
Has it been shot? Has it been prepped to cut? Has it been cut? What's the length of duration of the first edit of the scene? What day does it shoot on? And, and it's maintained by the amazing assistant editor team, um, Meg, Noah, Oliver, and Travis. And, and it's kept over the course of the season. If I did not have that document, I do not know, like I could do it, but I would might go crazy. I might go crazy trying to figure out. And I did actually start the season trying to plug all the episode days into the calendar of what we were shooting. And then I saw it start to change. And I'm like, oh God, no. And I tossed that away. And then you shared the document, which existed in season two, but I had somehow in that between season of amnesia, I had forgotten about it. And once I saw it, I'm so thankful it's here. The footage log. The footage log. So the footage log is a big way, a big part of making that happen. And then that, I don't know. That, I guess it seems like, I'm, I, I, does that, I, I feel like, I don't know. I, it's it's life changing that document, and and um, and I don't know how you would do the sandcastle thing, just in your mind looking at a one liner and looking at a post schedule, you know? Yeah, I think you you specifically. I mean, all of us, but especially you and Tiffany, really need to be like forecasting for the changes too. Like you know, it's like they make a decision on set, and then it trickles down to us, and then it can like impact our entire delivery plan you know so I think it's tough to like have a plan but also not be uh afraid to scrap the plan when you realize that it's not the most efficient plan anymore you know and like knowing when to like readjust and not just immediately panic but also be like okay our original plan was to deliver episode two first actually it should be episode four and like when you know you were usually the one making that call um but like, yeah, you kind of need that built-in flexibility to be like, we're going to stick with this plan until we know for sure it's not going to work. And then we got to have plan B and C and D waiting in the wings to like execute. Yeah. And and what you need on the other end of that is is a team that's ready for that too. And um, it's amazing how many times I would call up our supervising sound editor, um, mixer, major, um, or I would uh ben i don't know where ben is oh ben if ben's here ben craig um and i would tell them oh yes we've changed the plan now we are going to be onlining this show next and reconforming this show after that like and and no complaining and just like yep let's do it you know like let, let, let's do that like i it i think i probably always would finish with like a thanks and i'm sorry <laughs> but <laughs> But um, but you know it's it's so helpful to have collaborators who, you know, understand what we're trying to achieve and are willing to put the time and effort in, even though they know the work they're doing today may become the reconform two days from now. They don't stop putting the time and effort in on today's work. My friend, great. So let's go to the Zoom. Um, this is from Mike Early, and this is probably for um. Uh, well, all of you guys, uh, what led to the decision for the show to post in New York City instead of Chicago or even LA? Yeah, I mean, I could, I could take that one. You want to, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think with this show, uh, so Chris had worked on Rami uh, in our in our offices. Like you said, we did we did Rami here, and Chris had had posted with us here and. That was sort of at the at the beginning of when we were trying to nurture uh, directors and people who are creating shows and really create a home for people like that. And um, Chris was one of the first people that we met in that capacity. And so when he went to make the show, he and Josh had become quite close and they uh, they talked about making it together and Josh joined him in making it. Uh, so I think when it when it came to post, it sort of was always going to come here because of the relationship and because Josh started this house and Chris was from Chicago and it's sort of the marriage of those two things. Look back here, we have Chicago, New York and L.A., but L.A. is kind of, you know, because where we ended up, but New York and Chicago were sort of the things that birthed the show. And so it makes sense that, uh, well, Chicago obviously birthed the show, but New York in a post capacity. Uh, so it made sense it was coming here. So it really was because of the relationship and because of the house that that ended up coming here. And um, obviously when the show was made, season one, there was a lot more, eye, a lot less eyes on things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't the bear that it is now. It was a show that was coming to FX soon. And uh, who knows where it would be posted now or made now if it started right now at the height of its of its fame. But at that point, it made a lot of sense. 
and that's what's carried through. But New York is the is the is the place where the greatest shows are made. <laughs> and the greatest shows are I agree. exactly right. Yeah. We we do believe that. Yeah. And I guess just me personally, like, you know, almost every project I've done as a professional editor has been at Senior Post. And as an editor, it's just like so nice to have like a home base. I feel like it's so hard as you're like starting out on a project and you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to figure out like the lay of the land and the dynamics and I don't wanna like offend anybody and blah blah blah. And so like I personally am just like so grateful to be like, oh my God, like this is a space where like I know the people who work here are really friendly. I feel really comfortable. So anyway, I think we're just like love having that like yeah. roster is like a more official word, but like you know, the our extended like community of people that we know. They know the space, they know our layouts. I usually like working on premiere so we're mostly a premiere yeah, facility. Let's talk about that. Um, Bring your questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adobe. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's just I think I I always want to be working here. And so I think with we were going to be working on a show. I'm like, oh my gosh, of course, this would be like my first choice all the time. So it's it's great that like we've gotten to do so many different places. Yeah. So everybody knows uh, you guys use premiere. We do. Yeah, and love, love premiere, <laughs> right? So you guys have let, questions about that? Let the fighting begin. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We can't get into that right now. <laughs> no, so no. Yes, we okay. need to clear it out. There's yeah. room for wrestling, <laughs> thing, I think, right here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, productions. Yeah, productions is great. And I think, I mean, I was already sold on Premiere, but I think it's like a great way that they've been like competing with Avid and like so crucial for our team. Like it's so helpful to just like, you know, somebody makes a project, just open it right up. You can see who's like locked different, you know, bins of different projects. So um, especially in season one, and we were like completely remote. So this is still like the start of the pandemic. I mean, like the early days of the pandemic, I was like, okay, everyone we're going to send the sound effect, copy it to this exact folder so it doesn't get unlinked and blah, blah, blah. Like it was just like you spent so much time just mirroring drives and like keeping track of all the things. So like knowing that we have everything in productions, stored on LucidLink, everyone's in the same different projects. is just like makes it so easy to be like, we're going to work from home, you know, this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and be in the office Thursday, Friday. You can pick up right where you left off. You don't have to bring a drive. Don't you do anything like that. Um, clearly works for us so <laughs> yeah it, it works for us i will say as a as a post house too we we of course have avid as well um and some of our projects are on avid i think for for us that is a real sort of benefit and and an advantage because um there is something you know like premiere is, is great we we love premiere some people want to post on avid and that's and that's fun but i think um, it's more rare to find houses that can really do the same things that you would do in Avid on Premiere, and we we are that house. So uh, it's nice to have both both available because honestly, there are some things that you know some people really are tied to one or the other. We can go either one with the same sort of fluidity, which is nice. I think what is really cool about that is all in the same house, all the AEs or the editors can speak about it, and you know can have those conversations that make better workflows. And it's like you know if I did this totally. this way, we can do it this way, and just you know conversation wise it totally. just makes everything so much easier and there's so many like even recently there's so many people who are surprised to hear that you can do in premiere like the workflows that are, are possible in avid you know uh without the nexus you know that you can actually uh make that happen in premiere and you can you know uh so if you want to know how find us afterwards we'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no yeah. okay great well if anybody else has questions for premiere or avid please us, but we're gonna do one more question from the audience. Our shy audience, or not shy? <laughs> I know we are. It's been very thorough. I know. Very I know yeah. Hi, I'm Nick. Um, just curious, when the bear was like in its infancy, what kind of uh, movies or shows were inf influencing you from an editor standpoint? I love Good. this question. Yes. Yay. Um, so our main influence was like early Scorsese movies, which is so fun for me because I love Thelma Schoonmacher, who edits almost mm -hmm. all of Scorsese's movies. Um, and so the most formative movie for me was a movie called Bringing Out the Dead, which is about Nicolas Cage. He's an ambulance driver. And I had never heard of this movie. I'd never seen it. And Chris was like, you got to watch it. And it's like 
I think the DNA of that is in the bear so much because it's basically about a guy who has a really stressful job and he's kind of losing his grip on reality. Um, and then he'll go because he's an ambulance driver, then he'll go to the hospital and like check in on his patients. And then there's like really quiet, intimate scenes where he's checking out in on his patients. So they just did such a good job of like having these really chaotic moments and then having these really quiet moments. And that was something that like I really latched onto and something like we kind of keep returning to. Um, so yeah, just like the the style and and um intensity of Scorsese um we talked about like David O. Russell movies a lot too like Silver Linings Playbook but like just talking over each other like that really like intense everyone's competing for attention we definitely you know mirrored that in the pilot a bit um and we kept talking about season two being our Empire Strikes Back season which was really fun in terms of like influence where it was like okay everyone's gonna go on their own separate journeys and then come back and like defeat the Death Star together aka open the restaurant um which was so fun to think about and we even included a couple like cheesy like wipes across the screen in season two as like an homage to that so look out for this um but yeah I'm trying to think of other kind of like early conversations but yeah bringing out the dead is something that like I definitely return to and um even using like Raging Bull as an example too, like that opening montage of the bear. Um, I had never, like, I remember watching, you know, Raging Bull and being like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden they're like cutting to like color footage. And it's like, you know, super eight of their like, you know, family dinners together and their wedding and like how intimate that felt. And that was something we really tried to do in the like big opening montage of the show was like, okay, we're seeing Carmen in real life, but also using these still images of like family gathered around food and like seeing the city of Chicago and just like kind of trying to give you character backstory without like shoving exposition, exposition down your throat. So um, we're all obsessed with Scorsese and Thelma. So definitely honoring them as much as we can. <laughs> Awesome. So we're going to have one more questions from Zoom. This is from Angela Victor for David. Uh, what do you use to create post-calendar schedules? Any great software you're using? Oh, my God. I wish somebody would make something. Um, <laughs> we got to have another question after this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I just use Excel, sadly. <laughs> Um, I just use Excel because nothing, nothing actually seems to be able to encapsulate what, especially on a show like the bear, what you have to do in a given day. Like there's just not enough space to be able to fill it and read it. Like, I know that seems really weird, uh, but no, I have none of the like just widely distributed um, schedule um, software seem to work. Um, so I use that. I do have a, um, I, I guess to, I, I assume this is true of other post producers and post supervisors that there just isn't anything. I remember a good friend of mine who's a post producer telling me he kept like a an old computer because it ran one piece of software that he thought did work for this. And so he would like keep his, you know, I don't know, it was probably like a clamshell Mac or something because it ran that software. Anyway, yeah, no, there's sadly, um, I think probably most of us actually format our own Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> So there's an opportunity for them up there. Somebody needs to make <laughs> something happen. Awesome. So that's going to be it for us. Thank you to our speakers today. Thank you, everybody on the Zoom, for all your amazing questions. We really, really appreciate it. And please join us on our next um, upcoming events. Thank you. Bye-bye.